Hello, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are joining from. Uh, we are having participants joining us still, so we will wait a few minutes, one or two minutes more, and then uh, we will start. But in the meantime, we can uh, announce some housekeeping rules for this event. Silu, can you please? Yep. Yeah. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, please make sure you mute your microphone for now. And also please note that um, our meeting is currently being recorded and we'll share the link to the recording after the event. And also um, if you have any specific questions for the speakers or the moderator, please use the um, Q&A function on your um, Zoom menu. So if you have more general question discussion or whatever you want to share, um, you can use the general chat function at the bottom. Um, yeah, I think I'm handing back, handing it over to my colleague, April, who will be moderating the event. Okay. Um, hi again, uh, once again, everybody. Welcome to uh, this um, event to launch the report on developing countries' experiences with uh, extraterritoriality in competition law enforcement. We have uh, an excellent panel discussions and speakers with us today. Uh, I would now like to give the floor to Teresa, Ms. Teresa Moreira from Competition uh, and Consumer Policies branch of UNCTAD, our head of branch. Teresa, you have the floor, please, to open the event. Thank you very much, Abru, and good afternoon, good morning, good evening to all of you. And thank you very much for joining us um, today to launch the report on developing countries' experience with extraterritoriality in competition law. The report that we are launching, to, launching today is the fruit of um, a research project conducted within the UNCTAD Research Partnership Platform on competition and consumer protection policies that uh, has been uh, started in 2010 and that so far has produced very interesting partnerships and achievements. As most of you will probably know, the UNCTAD Research Partnership Platform, shortly just RPP, provides a, a space, a forum, to create synergies between competition and consumer protection authorities and the academia, provides opportunities for joint research between UNCTAD and scholars and universities in, that are working in the areas of competition and consumer protection policies, and to disseminate research findings to our network, network of respective authorities and academics in these fields. And it also provides us an opportunity to exchange ideas, discuss current challenges faced particularly by developing countries, which are the focus of the work of the whole organization of UNCTAD, and to offer some uh, solutions, some policy options. What we would like to see is that RPP research findings informs and helps shaping competition and consumer protection policy making, especially of developing countries, towards an inclusive and sustainable economic development. And I think that so far, we have been able to uh, achieve some very interesting reports, and we are committed to continue in this path. Today's event clearly shows that we have achieved all of these objectives with this report. Indeed, in the last three decades, the world experienced significant increase in international trade. However, in the interdependent global economy, cross-border anti-competitive practices affect many economies, and cause harm to trade and competition. Private international cartels alone are expected to have extracted over 1.5 trillion globally. Such harmful activities remain subject to national regulatory regimes in affected markets, frequently requiring extraterritorial application of competition laws. The report we are launching today makes a significant original contribution to the existing body of knowledge by filling an important gap in our understanding of developing countries' experience 
with the extraterritorial application of competition law. It relies on contributions from 40 developing countries and economies in transition. The report makes some very interesting recommendations for developing countries' competition authorities, which you will hear from its author, uh, Marek. At ANCTAD, we will consider um, integrating some of these recommendations in the part two of commentaries of the ANCTAD model law on competition, which um, uh, is regularly updated with case, load, uh, with case law references, with bibliographies, and of course, uh, amended legislation. The ANCTAD model law on competition uh, is, we believe, widely used by competition authorities in developing countries as a reference when they are assessing um, their legal and uh, institutional frameworks, their enforcement, and of course, they are considering any amendments or improvements. In this way, we will have linked list reports finding to our intergovernmental documents and processes, which we think is a very positive achievement. So the ANCTAD uh, research partnership platform, and concretely, we at the Competition and Consumer Policy Branch of ANCTAD are proud uh, to have supported and hosted this research conducted by Dr. Marek Martijins from Queen's University Belfast on the ANCTAD Research Partnership Platform. I would also like to take this opportunity to sincerely um, um, well, uh, thank our speakers of today that Abri will introduce. So we'll have two speakers uh, presenting countries' experience and four discussants that are, um, uh, well, some of them at least very regular contributors to the work of ANCTAD, namely under the RPP. So on this note, thank you very much also to the participants for following the launch of this report. We certainly hope that this will be followed by other interesting uh, reports under the RPP. And without further ado, I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Ebru Gotche Desmond to kick off the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Teresa, for your opening remarks and uh, to be with us to start kick off this event. Uh, now I would like to give the floor to Dr. Marek Martinishan, Senior Lecturer in Law, Queen's ba University, Belfast, to present the report and its findings. Marek is the one who conducted this, this research within the ANCTAD Research Partnership Platform, which we were very happy to have supported. Marek, you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much, Abru. Can you please confirm that you can see my presentation now? Lovely, thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here um, and then allow me to, to start by thanking ANCTAD for, for facilitating uh, this, uh, this work and enabling me to contact, conduct, that, conduct that, this research. Um, for the next couple of minutes, I, I provide you with an overview of, of the project and its findings. So what was the focus? We've been looking at extraterritoriality. We've been looking at application of domestic competition laws to entities which may not be present in the forums or in the country but whose conduct harms or may harm local consumers or producers. So we're thinking about situations such as international price fixing cartels or indeed foreign to foreign made mergers. And as um, Teresa has very rightly pointed out, uh, it is estimated that uh, private international cartels alone extracted very significant, uh, very significant amount of um, welfare internationally over one half trillion dollars. And we know, and that these are empirical findings, that international cartels overcharge much more than domestic cartels. And if you think about anti-competitive conduct, that when you look at it from the perspective of domestic economy, this is just the matter of distribution between the consumers and producers. Whereas in the transnational context, this is really transfer of wealth from affected state to the state hosting violators. Um, so I think it was very important to look into this issue also because we didn't know too much about the practice of developing countries. So the idea was to fill in an existing gap of our understanding of the status quo um, and the applicable uh, frameworks. The method used in this study was a short questionnaire, which with the help of ANCTAD and MEBRU in particular, uh, we managed to distribute to uh, competition agency all over the world. And that was combined with doctrinal uh, research. Overall, 
I've been collecting data in this project from 2017 to 2019. Uh, um, and I'm really very grateful. And this is a place when I would like to say thank you to colleagues in all the agencies that contributed to this project. Uh, we've received information from uh, 40 developing countries and economies in transition. And as you can see, that's a very diverse group when you think about geography, when you think about size, income levels, and also experience and expertise with competition law enforcement. Um, overall, it transpires that um, 34 countries out of the 40 that uh, you know, provided input into this work uh, recognizes and provides for, for extraterritoriality in do the domestic competition law systems. In 33 cases, that's the matter of uh, explicit provisions in domestic competition law. In the case of Chile, uh, that's embracement of extraterritoriality by means of judicial interpretation of the law. Um, if you think about extraterritoriality and the issue of time, you will see that that was a, a, a embracement of extraterritoriality was a prog progressing exercise. We've seen growing interest in embracing extraterritoriality from mid 1990s, and and you'll see that at the moment, the decisive majority of countries that took part in this work in this research embraced it. Now. Um, at the moment, uh, uh, it seems that the dominant paradigm is recognition of in-country economic effects of foreign conduct as necessary and sufficient link for extraterritorial application of domestic law, what we often call as effects doctrine. However, jurisdictional tests differ between countries. Um, sometimes we, we find different caveats in terms of what sort of effects are required to enable extraterritorial application of particular domestic regime. However, all those tests remain with the same paradigm on, of relying on in-country economic effects of foreign conduct. Now, diversity of tests may reflect the fact that international competitional templates are silent, are mute on this issue. And this is one of the reasons why I would be calling for um, formulation of, of um, such provisions in international competition law templates, such as model law and competition and the commentary to enable it for competition system, which not yet have extraterritoriality uh, enabled to be able to do so. And you know, in the report itself, the link to which has been provided on the UNCTAD website and also here posted a few minutes ago in the chat, you'll see examples of some of the jurisdictional tests from different countries. So for example, in case of Brazil, we we'll find a provision stipulating that this law applies without prejudice to the convention and treaties of which Brazil is a signatory to practices performed in full or in part on the national territory or that produce or may produce effects thereon. In, in case of Egypt, the provision of this law shall apply to acts committed abroad should this act result into the prevention restriction harm of the freedom of competition in Egypt and which constitute crimes under this law. Now, of course, the fact that we find the law on the books doesn't mean that developing countries or economies in transition actually have experience of enforcing the law in such a manner. However, out of countries that took part in this project, 24 reported some practical experience with transnational cases. Quite often, first experiences would focus on merger review. However, 40, 14 countries reported experience with restrictive agreements, multi-party conduct. These were typically larger jurisdictions, often following enforcement in other countries. But this is overall a very positive message. And here I, 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 I am uh, presenting one of the tables which we'll find in the report itself, which shows that um, countries reporting experience with uh, extraterritoriality can be found within different income groups, right? So, so this is not only uh, extraterritorial application of domestic competition law is not only practiced by those more well-off jurisdictions. Now, one of the important issues was to, uh, was to try to understand what are the challenges faced by the agencies. And uh, from, from the information I gather 
it seems that there's a couple of, couple of uh, issues here at stake at different stages in the, uh, in the enforcement uh, um, process. So some of, the, some of the issues related to domestic rules, uh, domestic procedural rules, especially when it comes to service of process in transnational cases, we still have challenges when it comes to collection and gathering of evidence. Some agencies reported that they find it challenging dealing with non-compliance uh, of foreign firms during investigations. There are still issues about insufficiency of existing international instruments regarding enforcement. And of course, we don't have really instruments when it comes to enforcement or execution of rendered decisions and judgments, and also relates to collection of and imposed fines in such cases. These are the more practical problems, but we have also systemic issues that were reported. The biggest systemic issue is trust, which sometimes is still lacking between agencies. Many agencies reported also disparities, differences when it comes to know-how and experience between agencies. And these differences sometimes make cooperation more challenging. And sometimes that's the issue of just lacking cooperation agreements. So we can, as you can see, we have two groups of problems, some which are more practical and some which are problems at what I would call meta level. Now, how to narrow these gaps? And here I'm referring also to the sister project and the research article published in the Journal of Competition and Economics, which expands on these solutions. Um, some of these problems, some of these existing gaps can be narrowed already at home. So competition, competition system could provide clear textual basis for extraterritoriality. Whenever that's not the case, you can expect challenges. And for example, I mentioned that in Chile, the issue of extraterritoriality has been resolved by means of judicial interpretation of existing provisions. However, when that, such a case was brought, it was extra capacity to apply Chilean competition law extraterritoriality has been robustly challenged. And indeed, we had a similar situation in past in India. So clarity in that regard, textual basis are very important. And then it's very important to think about the entire chain of enforcement. So thinking about procedural rules and service and how this can be improved to facilitate um, bringing such cases. And these are challenges faced not only by developing countries, but also by the developed regimes. And uh, for example, a couple of years ago, uh, Japan itself uh, changed their rules of service of process to enable service by means of publication to be able to uh, prosecute such cases. More fundamentally, I think it's very important for agencies to signal willingness to challenge uh, transnational viola violations and to act and accept the fact that it may be difficult and they may not always be successful. It is also important to narrow the information gaps. So quite often a cartel in one jurisdiction will be a cartel in the neighboring one. So I think it's very important to speak to neighbors in the agencies and share also fruits of your own work with them. So I think there is still scope for information sharing between the agencies, especially locally within particular regions. Another recommendation which I would like to make is that we should seriously consider using foreign decisions and judgments as prima facie evidence shifting the burden of proof. At the moment, we are looking at a system where in each and every jurisdiction where the same cartel is being discovered and prosecuted, it has to be proved uh, from the scratch. And I think that's, that's a huge, huge uh, um, inefficient use of resources. And as you can see, none of these uh, proposals actually requires international agreements, international negotiations. These are sort of practical, uh, pragmatic steps which will be taken to narrow the gaps uh, at home. What would be my brief conclusions? Extraterritoriality in competition law is now universally accepted in the developing world. Increasing number of developing countries take on cross-border cases, often relying on similar efforts in other jurisdictions. So we are seeing positive externality. And that's, that's, of course, very positive. Formidable challenges remain, but some can be addressed also domestically to narrow the enforcement gap. That said, further collaborative efforts are needed, and especially to develop trust between agencies. And there is still important role to be played by networks, regional initiatives, and all embracing platforms, such as UNCTAD, our host today. Thank you so much.
I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marek, for um, presenting us the report, the findings, the data, and the conclu your conclusions. And thank you for emphasizing uh, platforms like Unclad as an important, uh, the, the important role of these platforms uh, in, in narrowing the gaps, uh, particularly in sharing information and networking between agencies. I think that is our biggest role in this uh, competition world, we offer the largest platform forum for countries to interact with each other. And from there, you can have good cooperation efforts uh, come, come forward. Um, now we will hear from the representatives of two competition authorities. We have Ms. Nesrin Atta, competition expert from the Turkish Competition Authority, and Ms. Jade Lima, advisor for the general coordination of antitrust analysis at the Administrative Council for Economic Defense of Brazil, which we know as CAGI. Thank you both for being with us today. I will first uh, give the floor to Ms. Atta. Uh, Ms. Atta, could you please tell us about Turkish Competition Authority's experience with extraterritorial application of competition law? Okay. Um, you have the floor for 10 minutes, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so let me share my uh, presentation with you. Can you see it? Can you see the presentation now? Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You prefer to share where you want to share. Uh, I, I think it's better if we share with slide slideshow mode. Do you mind? Oh, okay. Yeah, Zilu can start sharing. Okay. Perfect, Zilu. Yes, please, Nes, okay. go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity on behalf of the TCA and myself. And I will try to share uh, the legal ground uh, of uh, extraterritorial enforcement of Turkish competition law and the TCA's experience in this regard. Uh, and um, um, next slide. Yes. Uh, the scope article of the um, uh, competition law in Turkey, the Article 2, uh, explicitly uh, provides that any undertaking operating in or affecting markets for goods and services within the boundaries of the Republic of Turkey is within the scope of uh, the Competition Act. And uh, as you may be familiar with, uh, the effect theory which creates an important basis uh, for extraterritorial application of local law is adopted uh, by the lawmaker uh, from the very beginning, uh, but we still face some obstacles while practicing it. Uh, now I will uh, try to provide some case examples to be understood. Uh, the first case, uh, we can move on to the fourth slide, please. Um, yes, the first case is a relatively old one uh, from 2010, uh, import coal case. And in this case, uh, it was uh, about an investigation which was including an agreement uh, on price fixing, controlling the amount of supply. And uh, in this case, uh, the TCA uh, had two uh, undertakings uh, which uh, were located outside of Turkey and had no subsidiary uh, within the Turkey's territory. Uh, and the one uh, which was a member of the European Economic Community uh, was located uh, in Austria. And the TCA uh, tried to notify the party under the customs union agreement uh, between the EEC and uh, Turkey. Uh, and 
uh, it the TCA got the help of the uh, foreign ministry, uh, the minister of foreign affairs, uh, and uh, tried to contact with the Austrian authorities. But its request was uh, denied uh, on the grounds of that uh, the uh, the issue should be uh, should have been dealt uh, on the community level rather than national level. Uh, and the TCA uh, tried to um, uh, find a way uh, to get information about the undertaking, uh, which was investigated in this investigation uh, from the EAC authorities. But uh, this time uh, it was denied uh, once again uh, under uh, 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 and the EAC authorities stated that uh, uh, it cannot share any information about any undertaking located in the EEC uh, with the concerns of confidential confidentiality. Uh, so, uh, in this specific case, we can understand uh, that the uh, the foreign country, the Austria and the, the EEC, as a community, was reluct reluct uh, reluctant to cooperate. Uh, to uh, facilitate the Turkish competition laws enforcement uh, beyond its territory. Uh, another example uh, is uh, Sun Express uh, Condor case, uh, which uh, uh, and uh, in this case uh, it was an uh, investigation uh, which was opened uh, upon uh, and uh, uh, and. Uh, Sorry, uh, an immunity uh, leniency application, and in this case, um, Condor, which was located in Germany, uh, 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 needed to be notified duly uh, to proceed during the investigation. And once again, the Turkish Competition Authority got the help of Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, under the international procedural law, uh, but the attempt uh, failed. Uh, but the Turkish competition authority did not give up and tried a different approach this time, a less complicated and a simple way. Uh, and um, Condor was notified through the National Postal Service and uh, successfully. Uh, and uh, the, I think in my opinion, it's maybe because Condor is a big corporate firm and it did not ignore or avoid the situation. Uh, and the last two cases that I will mention now uh, is not was not covered the, uh, with the questionnaire. Uh, so we want to share a, a more recent uh, case examples uh, with you. Uh, and the case, we can move on to the seventh slide, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, Arthur Marine Masterworld case. And in this case, uh, Masterworld was one of the investigated parties which was located in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, and uh, the Turkish Competition Authority tried to notify the party and uh, tried to um, uh, contact with the undertaking through uh, the um, international law procedure and with the help of the Minister of Foreign Affairs. But this time uh, we see uh, the uh, obvious willingness of the foreign country, the Netherlands, I mean, uh, to cooperate and facilitate the enforcement of competition law. Uh, and the undertaking was invited uh, to be notified, uh, actually. Uh, and uh, the undertaking did not show up uh, within the time limit, which was granted to it. Uh, and in the end of the time limit, it was assumed that uh, the party was notified duly under the uh, national law of the parties, I mean, the Netherlands and the Turkey. And the last case uh, is uh, the most recent one, uh, bank and financial institu uh, institution case. And in this case, um, the uh, during it was a prelim, preliminary investigation and during the investigation uh, a request of information was sent uh, to the subsidiary 
uh, of subsidiaries of the uh, uh, parent companies, which were located outside of Turkey, uh, and um, uh, the uh, subsidiaries uh, were asked to uh, transfer the uh, request of informa information to the parent company. Uh, and the defense side uh, argued that uh, it was not uh, uh, legal uh, uh, to be notified through subsidiary, and the subsidiary is not uh, has not has uh, did not have the capacity to provide the requested information as the information was in the possession of the parent company. But the Turkish Competition Authority did not uh, accept the uh, arguments. Uh, which is parallel to the EU's case law, and uh, said that concluded that uh, the notification which was made to the subsidiary, uh, whether it's operating uh, in the uh, investigated uh, market or not, uh, is a valid one, uh, and it's uh, the subsidiary's uh, liability to transfer transfer the request of information to the parent company. Uh, so uh, it was a mixture, this case is a mixture of a parent, uh, parental company liability, uh, economic unity, uh, and um, ter extraterritorial enforcement of the Turkish competition law. So to sum up, uh, obviously we, uh, we are still facing some obstacles while practicing the extraterritorial enforcement. Uh, and the main obstacles are related to the procedural law. Uh, and in the past, uh, we are uh, witnessing uh, the reluctance of the foreign companies to cooperate, uh, to facilitate uh, the, the enforcement of the national competition laws. But uh, in the recent times, uh, we can, uh, I, I think we can say that uh, it's uh, the uh, the it seems to be an improvement uh, and as for the substantial law uh, we can see that the TCA is uh, following the EU case law and stretching the law by reasonable legal justification for an effective enforcement beyond its territory. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nesrin, for uh, your presentation. Very, we have heard very interesting cases, both uh, positive, uh, showing good examples of some cooperation with the country hosting the undertakings. And in some cases, we have seen the difficulties and challenges faced, even uh, when there are um, free trade agreements or customs union agreements in place to facilitate in general to facilitate cooperation between the, the countries involved. So thank you very much for your presentation. You. Now I'd like to give the floor to Ms. Uh, Lima. Ms. Lima, can you please tell us Kaja's experience with extraterritorial application of competition law? Uh, you have the, uh, the floor for 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ebru. Uh, I would like to share my screen if I may. Um... Can you see the presentation? Yes, if you can put it in slideshow mode, that would um, be nicer. Yeah. Okay. Mm. I'll change the, the mode. I think it's for me it was showing the Is it okay? Uh, yes, perfect. Okay. Thank, you. okay, thank you. Well, again, uh, dear speakers, uh, dear attendees, dear moderators, good morning and uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jadvin Agrilima and I'm currently as uh, acting as deputy head of uh, the anti-cartel unit seven of the general superintendents of Kaji our division responsible for the investigation and analysis of international cartel cases in the Brazilian Competition Authority. First, in name of Kaji, I would like to thank Junktad for the invitation to participate in this event. It is a pleasure for us to be part in the launch of the report conducted by Dr. Marek 
Martinician, who we would also like to congratulate for his excellent and important work. Uh, so we're kindly asked to present some remarks on Kaji's experience within extraterritorial application of competition law. Uh, our presentation will focus on cartel, international cartel cases, despite of the importance of uh, international uh, mergers and other conduct cases. Um, firstly, uh, it's important to, to show uh, uh, the scope of application of Brazilian national legislation on competition defense. In Brazil, the effects of conduct causes to national market and consumers determine the, the competency of CAGI to pursue con conducts that involve multiple jurisdictions. According to the Article 2 of the Brazilian Competition Law, which I will ask permission to read, uh, without, without prejudice of any convention or, tr or treaties uh, in which Brazil might or Brazil is a signatory, this law is applicable to practices occurred within the Brazilian territory, either in whole or in, in part, or practices with which produce or may produce its effects within its territory. Uh, the paragraphs one and two are also important for uh, the application of Brazilian competition law in extraterritorial conduct. Um, it is considered to be domiciled in national authority, the foreign comp com company operating or having a subsidiary, branch office, office, facility, agent, or corporate representative in Brazil. The foreign company will be notified and subpoenaed of every procedure regarding this law in the person of its agent or representative responsible for its subsidiary, branch office, office, or facility in Brazil, regardless of the existence of powers of attorney or any explicit contract clause or provision within the company bylaws. Why this, this uh, as we'll see later, these uh, two paragraphs are very important for uh, and are related to, so, to some of our issues uh, regarding notification, um, our service uh, procedures, and also uh, to uh, the execution of our decisions. So, um, international international conducts are uh, by it, by its nature uh, a challenge for uh, every agency because, uh, especially regarding cartels, cartels are um, uh, are occult conducts. So, and each day they're, they're more sophisticated. Uh, so, um, to gather uh, evidence and of agreements occurred in international fields are even more uh, and, and, and a more uh, and an even more difficult mission. So, to surpass these issues, we at Kaji make use of some investi investigative tools such as don raids, hearing testimonies, and our agreement uh, programs which gives some benefits for those who confess the participation in cartel cases, give us information and evidence of the conduct in an investigation, seize their participation of the collusive agreement, and in some cases pay a contribution to a public fund. Uh, these are the leniency programs and the cease and desist, desist agreement. Uh, at Kaji, uh, the, these uh, two programs are one of the most important and most, most relevant uh, ways for us to gather information and gather uh, documents and evidence uh, of international cartel cases, uh, as we can see in the charts uh, below. Well, some, we, we brought here some data on international cartels enforcement in our uh, new new law. I would say that because we're we have uh, also the uh, 1884 uh, law that from 1994 that also had the same um, the same scope of international uh, persecution of internet of international conduct uh, and use the effect uh, the effect doctrine for um, its, uh, its um, 
its com its competency. And uh, as we can see here in in the chart, uh, our um, uh, nowadays the the leniency uh, the leniency agreements are one of the most important and are the uh, one of our main sources uh, to bring cases uh, here at Kaji. Uh, and we also have uh, important, uh, we also can uh, gather a lot of information and uh, evidence from our uh, cease and disease and disease uh, and desist agreements. There are kind of leniency, but they're only, uh, we only, uh, they're only applied to uh, the participants that were not the first in line. Uh, we only give the leniency for the first uh, uh, part that the the first parts that uh, present to 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 uh, propose the the agreement. So the other ones could just apply for uh, a cease and desist agreement that also uh, demands of the of the proponent uh, to uh, pay uh, to pay for a public fund a contribution. Um, and uh, about uh, regarding our fees, um, we can see that uh, we we are having like a, a decrease in the convictions of international cases in the last in the last few years. So not uh, seeing about um, an Analy uh, analyzing those data, we can see that our, our amnesty programs are still fundamental for opening international cartel investigations. However, uh, there's a general tendency of decline of the number of leniencies along, around the globe, as we could also see from the OECD competition policy trends uh, recently uh, brought. And there was also a significant reduction of season degrees homologations by Cadiz Tribunal regarding international cartel cases since 2019. Uh, another finding is that compared to previous years, the number of convictions in international cartel cases has also proportionally decreased in the last four years. So we can see that uh, the enforcement of this conduct uh, in Kaji, even we have like uh, uh, a long tradition of international cartel enforcement. Well, our first first case brought was the vitamins case in 1999. Uh, we are ha we face some we still face some issues uh, regarding uh, international cartel enforcement. Uh, and for us, one of the, the, the ways we find to trying to uh, deliver and solve these problems is our, uh, our uh, international cooperation uh, agreements and, uh, and, share, uh, and shares uh, with other jurisdictions. Uh, we have experience with different degrees of cooperation since uh, the international uh, notification of individual and legal entities, uh, and also uh, in investigation proceedings. Uh, even uh, we have a very interesting case of uh, sharing uh, of simultaneous, uh, simultaneous down rates uh, established between Brazil, uh, the USA, and Europe. Yeah, by uh, result of a cooperation between CAGI, GO, DO, the DOJ, and DigiComp. Uh, in the compressors case, it was a, uh, um, those down rates happened uh, simultaneously in all those jurisdictions uh, and was a success. This case was recently uh, judged by Cadiz Tribunal. Uh, so we also have the international services. Uh, we have technical corporations as well, and also information exchange. Uh, which uh, we we need uh, and waiver of, of conf uh, waivers of confidentiality from uh, the parts related to uh, the agreements we we establish. Otherwise, we we might um, we might uh, make uh, face some troubles 
with uh, with the uh, confidence of our of the the parties that come to to Kaji to share those information. Uh, so well, what we what are the main hurdles we encounter uh, in nowadays in Kaji's and international, especially international cartel cases? As we said, we have many procedural uh, uh, issues, especially uh, regarding uh, service, service of process. That was also mentioned by Professor Martinez in uh, report. Uh, we have some, uh, uh, actually, uh, it, th this is actually our main uh, struggle uh, in our proceedings because our, our when we compare to other other cartel cases, uh, international cases, they take uh, longer to uh, be be closed, and um, especially because they take long times to we can actually serve uh, the notifications to to the defendants. So uh, as we can see, it take up to seven months to get completed uh, the all the service. Uh, process and uh, we we here at Kaji we have uh, uh, some kind of joke that we have like those big this huge uh, boxes full of documents that have traveled more to Europe uh, than most of Brazilians they have got, came they have uh, came back and forth uh, much more than most of Brazilian uh, citizens. And, it, and unfortunately, that's an issue. Uh, even Bra uh, Brazil, Brazil uh, is a, a, a signatory of uh, the, Hague, uh, the Hague Convention uh, of, um, for uh, international service. Uh, we still face those, this kind of, of issues. Uh, and also one, one that we, we see that's one of mo the most challenging, challenging issue in our part is the execution of rendered decisions. Uh, that's the collection of imposed fines, especially when we see uh, companies and individuals that are not from Brazil because, uh, and they have not, they're not domiciled in Brazil because as we saw in the, the article two, paragraph one and two. If if uh, the party uh, is uh, domiciled in Brazil in any way, you can serve uh, in uh, its representative in Brazil. But if they they're not, we have to to make use of those uh, notifications and uh, international corporations, which. Are more difficult, and when we we see uh, this uh, procedure, our proceedings to execute to collect the imposed fines, it, this is even uh, a bigger issue because most of them doesn't have uh, an international uh, national uh, taxpayer ID, uh, and they are they're uh, needed to uh, include those parties in our overdue liabilities collection program. That is a phase, uh, a stage before our judicial recovery, which also has, uh, and if we come to the judicial recovery, it's also, uh, it takes like a long time to <laughs> actually get and, and finally uh, enforce those, the, those fines. So um, we see that uh, this is a, a big, those are our main issues uh, regarding uh, international cartel cases. Uh, these are uh, problems that are priority uh, at Kaji to solve. We still don't have uh, an answer for all of those, those situations, but uh, we are very aware and uh, making all our, our efforts to improve the efficiency of our activity and guarantee uh, the respect of our agency and the enforcement of antitrust rules here in Brazil. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jade, uh, for this very interesting presentation. Um, now I'd like to turn to our panel of discussants. We are very privileged to have with us today Professor Alexei Ivanov, 
Director of BRICS Competition Law and Policy Center, National Research University, Higher School of Economics in Moscow. We have Professor Imalda Maher, Sutherland Full Professor of European Law, Sutherland School of Law, University College Dublin. And Professor Chinlan Wu, Faculty of Social Sciences from the University of Nottingham. And lastly, Professor Spencer Weber Waller, John Paul Stevens Chair in Competition Law, Director of the Institute for Consumer Antitrust Studies from Loyola University, Chicago. Thank you all uh, to be with us today. So I will follow the alphabetical order of speakers and I would like to start with Professor Alexei Ivanov. Alexei, you have the floor, you have 10 minutes, please. Oh, thank you very much, Hebrew, and uh, congratulations again, Marek, for a very interesting, insightful report you prepare, and I see it uh, really like contributes to the discussion on extraterritoriality and in general, what developing countries can do. Uh, I, what I, I highly appreciate it in your work is actually bringing to the attention, to the spotlight, this topic of how developing countries can actually change their laws to adapt it them now, to, to make this practically. Uh, so you focus on practical solutions, which actually make uh, developing countries more efficient in regulating the global economy. And we know that extraterritoriality now is basically a topic which, you know, currently you have to deal constantly when you deal with global, with modern markets, because modern markets, they all actually global markets. You don't really have too many nationally contained markets anymore. And uh, especially when you talk about digital economy, about IP rights, uh, pharmaceutical uh, businesses, uh, vaccines now, all these markets, they essentially global energy even became global, food markets, global food value chains, they all global. So authorities have to think globally, act locally, but also in relation to global phenomena. And this, of what, what uh, in the past was considered as exceptional form of behavior, externality was considered as exceptional thing. Currently, it's actually mundane. It's something which you have to deal on daily basis. And when you missing instruments, tools, you know, uh, legal uh, regimes uh, to deal with this phenomena, you actually can't effectively uh, defend competition. You can't actually def effectively uh, support development of competition in your markets and on global scale. And uh, that's quite annoying thing, actually. And I know when we're dealing with the cases of uh, big mergers, like global companies merging together, we see a lot of very strategic maneuvering kind of behavior when they do forum shopping, they uh, apply very strategically first to some smaller jurisdictions and to uh, a bit larger ones. They constantly calculate those you know, timelines uh, because everyone has deadline, they have to deal with the mergers, they have to either clear or, you know, uh, to suggest some remedies. And that's sometimes very strict deadlines. And uh, let's say they, they go to South African authority, they face this 60 uh, days, you know, uh, period when South African authority has to decide on this merger, while not applying to any other developing countries, let's say even within BRICS. And uh, South African authority can't cooperate with neither Russian, no Chinese, no Indian authority. Why? Because they have to deal with this particular application, which was submitted only to them. Uh, uh, the company didn't apply to Russia or China at the same time, let's say. So they strategically apply to those authorities which have to close the uh, they make this decision and you know clear the merger first and then go to others. And through this kind of manipulating basically behavior of developing countries authorities, uh, deterring them to cooperate effectively. So what authorities can do, let's say, and that's what kind of inspired by your research, I think they can introduce norms into their laws saying, if you, uh, according to the national laws of other, let's say BRICS countries or other developing jurisdictions, neighboring countries have to apply in other countries, you have to apply simultaneously. 
so that uh, we can start cooperate at the same time, share information, share, share insights, because it's very difficult to analyze what's happening in modern markets, especially technologically driven markets, innovation driven markets. You have to really like uh, think or think about so many different things, and you have to uh, rely on quite uh, serious expertise, which normally you can't even afford as a authority, especially in developing country. So any form of cooperation, any form of you know cooperative framework would be very helpful for small and medium-sized authorities, for, for bigger authorities, even like, I don't know, Russian authority, for instance, it would be of great help if we could share information to, together with our colleagues in Brazil, India, you know, uh, China. But uh, the current regime doesn't allow us effectively doing this because uh, there is confidentiality, in, you know, requirement. Uh, there is very kind of um, a lack of established uh, channels for sharing information. And even if you have trust, you rightly indicated that trust is one of the big issues in deterring cooperation among authorities. But even if you have, have trust, like trust among BRICS authorities, for instance, you're still lacking procedural tools. So let's say we introduce in our laws some provisions saying if you apply in, uh, in one jurisdiction, you have to apply simultaneously in other jurisdictions as well. If you did not do this, so this, the clock is stopped, for instance. For a period, you hesitating to apply it. You're kind of manipulating you know, these procedural rules. You're manipulating these deadlines. This kind of efficient tool to encourage, stimulate cooperation with regard to mergers. There could be similar things introduced for other uh, cases, for cartels. For instance, in our report, very, very complementary report, which BRICS Competition Law and Policy Center published uh, this year as well, in the context of working group on transnational cartels, probably, you know, we use similar methodology uh, distributing uh, questionnaire among authorities. And we got a very interesting, insightful responses saying, look, we, we do want to cooperate. Authorities saying we do want to cooperate. We want uh, the cooperation would be more inclusive, open, you know, more efficient. But sometimes, you know, the laws were designed in a way, and you rightly mentioned that neither model law uh, which was, uh, you know, distributed before. Uh, no, like other international tools, they were not even kind of encouraging authorities to cooperate more effectively. So procedural tools were designed to deter this type of cooperation. And actually developed authorities like American or European authorities, they're kind of overcoming this. Uh, sometimes, you know, uh, in kind of uh, a very elegant, neatly way, you know, not really like uh, uh, publicizing too much, a lot of informal uh, negotiations, talks, and they have very, in, in very kind of integrated cohesive framework of uh, dealing with big cases, uh, but developing countries don't. And I would say it was probably done by design some years ago when uh, these competition regimes were proliferated around the world. And many developing countries, they introduced laws without this type of facilitating, you know, mechanisms. So we, we definitely have to, to change this. I think it's a great idea. It's a great initiative uh, started by Junktat to bringing this kind of topic to the spotlight, you know, and uh, you know that there is a, a great work done by Junktat also in, in, in re with regards to the Section F guidelines, uh, which was uh, uh, supported by FAS Russia initially and as a kind of idea which brought, brought to, to, uh, to Junktat because the UN set of principles and rules on competition was, was not actually elaborated uh, enough in terms of international cooperation, encouraging a uh, section F was not working for years. So it's time to revitalize these rules. We are living in global world. Extraterritoriality is something normal, is something authorities have to deal on daily basis. So we have to introduce tools and mechanisms. Uh, thank you very much for this insightful report. Thank you, Junktat and uh, RPP for bringing this in and looking forward for further uh, work together on this. And we're happy to support uh, all sorts of initiatives, you know, going into particular subjects from cartels to conduct cases to merger cases. I think there is a huge room for, uh, for work, for research in this area. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, Alexei, for respecting the time allocated and for your very interesting remarks. Actually, in a very short period of time, you referred to the importance of cooperation, but also the hurdles in front of cooperation between agencies, even when agencies trust each other, like in the case of BRICS. And you refer to some practical uh, points to take up by agencies and by jurisdictions, maybe by legal systems, what can they do to 
uh, to eliminate these hurdles on the way. And thank you for referring to our work, uh, the work within UNCTAD on um, efforts to operationalize Section F of the UN set on competition. I hear your call on operationalizing these, uh, these rules, which, which is not easy, as you can um, acknowledge. So uh, you refer to the need for introducing tools and uh, mechanisms that will help operationalize these kind of international rules, which are already in place. Actually, we recently celebrated um, the, the, the anniversary of the UN set. So um, thank you for your remarks. Um, now, I would like to give the floor to Professor Imelda Maher. Professor, what do you have <laughs> to tell us in this area? We are listening to you. Thank you. 10 minutes. Thanks very much, Abru. Um, um, hello, everybody. I'm just looking to move my slide, there we go. All right, so it follows on nicely from what um, Alexia has been saying. I just wanna thank everyone for the opportunity to be here. It's great to be on such a, an interesting panel to, um, and um, to get to reflect on this excellent report. The report is concerned with interagency collaboration, seeing it in part as a solution to the obstacles, the procedural obstacles that have been identified to effective extraterritorial enforcement and challenging factors impeding with that cooperation have included differing levels of expertise between agencies and the absence of bilateral agreements, which um, Chin Lan Wu will talk about later. And also, as has been already flagged, is this lack of trust. It report also notes how UNCTAD is an important forum for trust, which we have identified as a foundational requirement for interagency cooperation. And indeed, as already mentioned, these UNCTAD, the 2021 principles on cooperation themselves note the importance of trust. So what I want to look at is the importance of trust for interagency cooperation. I'm going to tease that out a little bit. And then I want to look at the role that agency networks can play in this process of enhancing and building up notions of trust. So Song et al, and if anyone wants the references, I'll send them on if they ask me to, um, in a paper in 2019 said that not talking about competition specifically, but says that in general, trust is essential for inter-organizational governance networks. Why? First, it reduces transaction costs. How? By facilitating predictability. You don't have to wonder what the person is really saying because you have an element, you have a certain foundational trust in what they are telling you. And secondly, it removes the need for complex contracts or arrangements. That goes back to the earlier comment around being able to pick up the phone been able to have informal conversations. Secondly, it reduces the risk of free riders or opportunism. Are you contacting me to do your work for you is the, the subtext if you like. Instead, we have core transactional values within the network um, which are reciprocity and collaboration. And finally, it stimulates learning, information sharing and improves knowledge between agencies. Therefore helping with the expertise question um, that was identified. Now for networks, we do need common goals. And in, I, I think it's fair to say for competition agencies, we do have common goals and a common discourse. Just one little caveat on that. Common goals do, does not mean you have uniform competition regimes. Now I know this might create some friction in practice, but nonetheless, I think it's important to say. Competition regimes don't have to be uniform because they have to be embedded within domestic legal orders and domestic political systems. But at the same time, they have to look beyond their borders to the nefarious effects of external restrictive agreements that may impact within their jurisdiction, which is what we're talking about today. I call this varieties of competition. So we can have varieties of competition, just like we can have varieties of capitalism. And I've um, edit a book on this with uh, Mike Dadl in back in 2013. So with if there is a trust embedded within a network, we can have a higher tolerance of variation. Because, and that variation is important because Budzinski has said for a long time that variation in competition can support innovation. So trust can do two, can act, do two potentially paradoxical things. On the one hand, trust can encourage and support convergence and it can also allow for what we would call considered divergence or informed divergence. So to summarize on trust, helps with cooperation, knowledge sharing, 
and innovation, and hence can underpin cooperation in more targeted and specific individual cases. What's the role of networks in this process? First of all, what do we mean by a network? And this Borzel work on this is very useful. Again, she's not talking specifically about competition agencies, but it translates across nicely. So by networks, we tend to mean non-hierarchical coordination. We need, there's usually an emphasis on informal interactions by actors who have interdependent interests and are looking at problem solving. Uh, typically networks operate in the realm of soft law, that is norms that are non-binding. And typically that's where we find guidelines, recommendations and information sharing. This can be, um, may not go far enough, which I'll talk about in a minute. For effective enforcement coordination, we require a stable high trust network it needs to be backed up by some domestic law, and going back to the earlier speakers, and ideally international law. Again, that goes back to the report. I would suggest the high watermark for enforcement coordination is the European Competition Network. Um, now, it has very particular characteristics, just to mention a few. It is supported by European law. There is a common purpose, but not just a common purpose of enforcing competition law. The agencies involved actually enforce the same competition rules, the EU rules. Now, networks typically are have no hierarchy, but there is an there is an explicit hierarchy in the ECN, which is if something if a competition agency um, becomes a bit maverick, the Commission can assume responsibility for a case. They can take a case off an agency, and they've never done that, and it doesn't operate on that basis. It operates on a consensual basis, but that is written into the law. But more generally, and perhaps more importantly, is that there are more general legal, legal obligations on the member state governments that they have a duty of sincere cooperation under European law. And breaches of that general principle can land you in up before the Court of Justice of the European Union. So there's a strong legal context within which this network operates. So on the one hand, we have a highly formalized European competition network model and at the other end of the scale, we have a highly informal international competition network model where there are over 110 members, there's no rules, no secretariat, no building, really. And um, so it's a highly informal information exchange system with loads of guidelines and recommendations and practices published on their very useful website. But between those extremes, we have a number of other fora, just to run through them briefly. With the OECD, we've got the Global Competition a Forum on Competition, which, which meets annually. We have regional centres in Lima, Budapest and Seoul. In UNCTAD, there's the Model Competition Law, already discussed. There's the Group of International Experts. There's this Research Partnership Platform. And of course, UNCTAD is particularly well known for its technical assistance programmes. We've had three iterations of COMPAL in Latin America. We had AFRICOMP in Africa. And the emphasis is very much on this notion of building expertise, which helps to underpin trust as agencies are confident of the professional acumen of those they are dealing with. Now, networks are very varied. They can be longstanding. The Nordic Council has been around, I think, since 1959, certainly the 1950s. They can be based on language, which is also important, with the Lusophone, which is a Portuguese network, with the Ibero-American Forum on Competition. It can be based on trade agreements, European Competition Network I've already mentioned, the APEC Competition Law and Policy Group, ASEAN Experts Group on Competition, and we also have newest regional networks, the African Competition Forum, of which South Africa is currently chair and has 34 members, and the Competition Forum for the Arab Region, which, with which both OECD and UNCTAD are involved and has just held its second meeting. However, I would suggest that these larger networks on their own are not enough. They're certainly not the whole answer. They're useful for knowledge exchange, but stronger links require more than an annual conference, especially in relation to procedural issues such as evidence sharing or, or uh, notification as well. And confidential information just by the by is a feature of the ECN, which is one of the things that makes it so powerful. So how can we the non, so they're not the full answer networks, um, but they do have a role to play in. But what are the characteristics or what qualities do we need for them to be effective or things to bear in mind? First of all, they take time. They're based on relationships and relationships take time to develop. 
They're based on a commonality in aims and objectives, as mentioned already. They require common language, common geographic area, going back to comments um, that Marek made earlier. They require technical expertise at a high level, but they also require other very practical resources. IT is very important. You want effective and sound IT so you can communicate in fora such as this. Uh, legislative support, as already mentioned by the previous speaker, and administrative support. And I would suggest what you need is this notion of legal backup. So ultimately, soft law won't do it for you. Recommendations and guidelines can only take you so far. You need a hybrid regime where there's hard law that gives it some teeth. In other words, networks need government, not just governance. They need hard law to move beyond general information sharing and technical assistance. And as today's report states, procedural barriers need greater collaboration for effective extraterritorial enforcement, which requires greater trust. So networks are part, but only part of the answer to trust building, as they can help to underpin bilateral engagement needed in specific cases. Thank you. Thank you very much, Imelda, for these remarks, emphasizing the role of networks, of course, the role of trust and networks helping to build trust. And we are uh, very happy to be providing one of the informal networks, the governmental group of experts on competition law and policy every year. And we have our academic network, RPP, that we try to connect uh, agencies and academia. So now I'd like to turn to Chen Lan Wu. Yes, Chanlan, you have the floor for 10 minutes. Please share your insights on the report with us. Thank you. Thank you, Ebru, and uh, good afternoon from the UK to dear colleagues, attendees, and uh, the participants in the, uh, in the forum. Um, it's a privilege for me to be on the panel. Um, and I would like to say thank you to Professor Alexi and Professor Maher, my learned colleagues, for setting out the contextual and the theoretical framework on this topic. And also warm congratulations for a timely and excellent report by Marek. Uh, if I may contribute to the discussion by um, looking at the bilateral cooperation uh, of the US, EU and Chinese uh, competition agencies in their efforts of strengthening the international antitrust uh, enforcement. Um, so that would be the focus where I, I wanted to, uh, to basically uh, discuss on. Um, and so by 2019, uh, you would notice that the US, um, US and China and EU and China have established a certain bilateral cooperation based on their respective memorandum. And this works in line with the already existent treaty-based US-EU bilateral cooperation. So what we see, um, as you can see, that these bilateral cooperations, despite their variance in terms of legal forces, they have um, shown certain common features um, uh, and, and which suggest an emergence of, of a model of collaboration and which we could basically see um, that uh, these common features including uh, sharing of information that would include the sharing of um, both uh, confidential information and the authority held non-confidential information. First, and the second is the element of committee, and uh, especially the positive committee. And third one is the consultation among competition agencies. The cooperation among, between the US, China, EU, China, and US, EU, somehow they converge to have all these common features, but the level of cooperation vary from one to another. What we can see is institutional wise, there has been a maximum cooperation model as seen by the US and EU, whereas there are some minimum elements of, of cooperation between US and China, but there's a slightly more progressive cooperation between the EU and China, which can be seen in some elements of positive committee. And um, for example, the sharing of information and the uh, actually agreed uh, uh, confidentiality waiver. 
So that's the background. If we apply that to the US, EU and Chinese efforts of enforcing their respective competition laws extraterritorially against one international LCD panel cartel, uh, which kind of existed from 26, 2006 to 2012, um, you would see um, actually each, um, uh, uh, each enforcement uh, actually was quite fruitful and quite effective. But uh, what we have observed from that particular enforcement uh, is that um, in the case of China, um, Chinese anti-monopoly law had explicitly provides for effects, effects doctrine-based extraterritoriality of competition law. But in that particular case, the Chinese agency did not apply the anti-monopoly law per se, but applied another uh, a statutory tool to enforce and basically regulate the international cartel. Nonetheless, the agency had interpreted that the particular legislation has extraterritoriality application and with reference to the effects doctrine. And in terms of, so that helps, you know, establishing the jurisdiction in terms of the, um, the substantive assessment, uh, each had uh, referred to the global sales of that particular international cartel, which inevitably resulted in overlapped fines and, and, um, and, and um, uh, sometimes um, basically overlapped calculation of the harm caused to respective territorial economy. Um, and whether did um, that particular um, enforcement, the, the multiple enforcement under the background of bilateral cooperation, did that really deter a certain uh, international cartel? In the case of China, one of the cartel lists actually chose to strategically comply with the Chinese legislation by not cooperating. Uh, because it has, according to its own calculation, um, it was not actually very cost effective to cooperate. Um, and of course, it received a, a relatively huge fine. But did that really, I mean, the the, 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 unilateral, the unilateral enforcement and bilateral cooperation arguably did not really effectively deter the international cartels. So what are the implications that we can derive from these bilateral corporations? Um, what we can deprive, uh, derive is first, um, there is an embrace of extraterritoriality of competition law by developing economies. In the case of China, um, China has actively referred to this particular legal norm, which had been ejected by the courts of leading competition regimes into the transnational space. And therefore, China had assimilated it and made it become one provision of its statutory law, but it has taken one further step and basically confers such principles, such effect to other legislations, and therefore made the effects based territorial extraterritorial application of competition law as a kind of a guiding principle of its competition regime. What we can further derive uh, is that. Um, um, and the um, the despite there are bilateral corporations among these global trade powers, uh, the regulation remains uh, fragmented. Um, and why the I mean even despite there's enhanced cooperation between China and the EU in terms of information sharing, in terms of confidentiality waiver, and element of positive uh, comity, but the regulation remains fragmented mainly because. Um, the fundamental value of the effects doctrine remains at protecting the overwhelming domestic interests. And that makes the individual competition regimes very motivated to have very strong unilateral enforcement against the international cartel. And in, in certain circumstances, in the case of international LCD panel uh, uh, cartels, it basically makes the sharing of information redundant once a leading competition authority or any competition authority had completed its own investigation. There was no need basically to share. And so that's the challenge that's been raised by this case is what's the motivation of sharing the of sharing these information. And uh, this could also be related to Professor Maher's uh, excellent presentation on uh, the trust building. Um, so, um, 
so that basically is, is an interesting uh, case to illustrate that the bilateral cooperation has its limitations. And that's why I would uh, like to congratulate Marek for a timely and important uh, report, uh, uh, um, uh, which then can bring us to a multilateral influential fora as UNCTAD, uh, where there are there can, where more innovative policy tools uh, can be considered and developed. For example, in a multilateral fora as UNCTAD with development-oriented uh, 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 agenda, then we could look at, uh, for example, to reconsider and develop the relevant transnational repertoire about the extraterritorial application of competition law tailored to developing economies based on the effects doctrine. Uh, but not limited to that, maybe, and um, could also consider um, uh, innovative policy tools of having minimum but guaranteed information sharing among uh, developing economies, not only among developing economies, but among all the competition agencies, where there could be certain uh, mutually accepted uh, uh, confidentiality protection so as to enable the agencies to, to share information among themselves. So that will be my main uh, discussion. And again, um, thank you, Marek, for any congratulations for an excellent and timely report. And uh, thanks for having me on the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Chenlan, for your remarks and for calling for some uh, multilateral fora like UNCTA to work on some policy tools uh, that can facilitate the extraterritorial application of competition law, especially in developing countries. And uh, telling us about the experience of China with the US and with the EU uh, and the bilateral cooperation experiences. Uh, now I'd like to invite our last speaker, Professor Spencer Weber Wohler, he has been very patiently listening to all the speakers before him. Now I'm looking forward to hearing from you, Professor Weber. Please, the floor is yours. You have 10 minutes. We will run out of time, but we will still listen to you. Thank you. Thank you, Weber. Uh, thank you to UNCTAD and, and congratulations to Mark on a terrific report and, and a really valuable project. And I've learned a lot, I appreciate, um, and I won't duplicate the terrific things that have already been said today. I wanted to focus on two very practical presumptions that can be an effective part of the toolkit of uh, both developed and developing countries uh, trying to enforce their laws on an extraterritorial basis. One, I just wanna briefly mention because it's been talked about, which is a presumption that uh, parent and subsidiary are a single economic actor. It, it applies both defensively. We know in most many jurisdictions that a parent and subsidiary are not deemed to be separate for purposes of conspiring with each other. But I think the flip side also applies. And in many jurisdictions, the unity of a parent and subsidiary for both service of process and liability is a very important tool. It's based on theories of agency and occasionally the joint and several liability of, of co-conspirators. Uh, but um, uh, again, as, as several people have observed, it also depends on obviously having a subsidiary in a particular jurisdiction to achieve service of process on a parent who may have participated in a, a transnational a conspiracy or cartel of some kind. I wanna spend the bulk of my remarks though, expanding on something that Mark touched on in his report and his excellent uh, accompanying article which is I think there is a really great potential for expanded use of the findings of other jurisdictions that are relevant to a transnational cartel uh, from the point of view of a developing country that's deciding what and how to do it. So in, in many jurisdictions, this is often referred to as res judicata or collateral estoppel. Uh, I, I think uh, res judicata, I'll just put aside for another day, but the idea of, of collateral estoppel or claim preclusion, where some issue relevant to the case has been fully and fairly litigated or found by a, a body. Uh, it is certainly appropriate to not have to literally reinvent the wheel and simply adopt a, a presumption, perhaps rebuttable, perhaps not, that a particular set of facts that has been found in one jurisdiction is equally true but appropriate in another jurisdiction. Let me give you three examples that have some connection to the United States, but I think can be generalized. First, 
is Section 5 of our Sherman Act, which says that findings in a government uh, antitrust litigation are presumed to be valid in a follow-on private litigation. And so uh, in, in many cases, when a defendant has pled guilty or been found guilty in a criminal cartel uh, matter, these findings do not have to be relitigated in any private follow-on triple damage litigation. There'd be no reason why uh, where someone has been found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt in a U.S. court of law, why the findings in that case were appropriate to other jurisdictions as to the existence of a conspiracy, who the members were, what the scope of it was, what the relevant products were that, that were affected, perhaps even the amount of commerce or the overcharge where uh, there's no reason to believe there's a difference between how it played out in one jurisdiction versus the other. Uh, these are all ripe for use in other jurisdictions. But there's, um, as they say in advertising, but wait, there is more. <clears throat> uh, I have been involved in two matters uh, that are just examples of, I think, good practices that could be generalized. A long time ago when I was in private practice, there was private antitrust litigation in the United States relating to um, a market survey research. There was a leading company called AC Nielsen that had found to have uh, uh, had market power in certain relevant markets in Canadian government litigation. And I can share with you uh, offline, if anyone is interested, in a finding of a U.S. court uh, in, a, in a subsequent U.S. litigation that simply adopted under claim preclusion some of the findings of that Canadian uh, uh, bureau uh, that were relevant to the U.S. litigation. So again, no need to reinvent the wheel. And then more recently, the opposite. Um, many, obviously, most of you are familiar with the, the decade of litigation involving Microsoft and the so-called browser wars, extensively litigated by the government uh, and, 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 and a victory as to liability and, and, and a certain limited relief, and then various private actions, some of which went to findings of fact, others were settled. However, uh, late in this series of cases, there were Canadian private class actions. In full disclosure, I uh, uh, acted on behalf of the plaintiffs in that matter, but there was extensive litigation in Canada as to which of the various U.S. findings were and uh, were or were not appropriate for uh, to be binding on the defendant in the Canadian uh, litigation that was ultimately settled. So uh, I think these are all important uh, examples of how claim preclusion in one country, how, how litigated findings where, where someone has actually found facts to be true can bootstrap and help a case uh, going on in another country. Now, uh, typically this would still require oftentimes causation and a proof of causation in any particular jurisdiction, unless that was previously shown in the prior case. And also to the extent that you had to quantify the harm in a particular market uh, in order to impose a fine or to find damages, uh, that is likely not to have been litigated in the prior case. Um, however, it's not impossible. So um, I know I don't have a lot of time and all of you have been very patient. I uh, can tell you that uh, Mark and I hope to sort of pursue particularly this uh, important issue in further work that he has teed up in his article and in the report. And I would personally hope uh, and suggest that uh, UNCTAD uh, highlight this issue in its commentary. And uh, I would suggest to UNCTAD members to explore incorporating or using these types of principles in their own domestic law. I'd go so far as to say it is probably po possible to craft a model law as to issue preclusion that could uh, uh, <clears throat> then be used uh, by interested jurisdictions who either wanted to pursue that as a matter of statutory reform or use in litigation, administrative, or in the courts. So I'll stop there. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Professor Buller. Um, apologies, you had um, little time that you could have gone, gone, gone further. But you said very, uh, very important things, interesting points, uh, even announced your interest to pick up one of the issues, one of the challenges in front of extraterritorial application of competition law with Marek and with maybe with UNCLAD. So we are very happy to hear that. Thank you very much for, for that offer. And I would like to thank all our speakers. Uh, we would in principle have a 
session for Q&A, but we didn't have time. I just see one question put in the chat by one of our, um, one of our friends, colleagues from South Africa, Dr. Laura Best. I don't know if she's still online with us. Um, so she's um, asking, she's vice chair of consumer tribunal in South Africa. So she's asking, she's bringing in this consumer the human face aspect uh, as victims of international cartels. So I will read her question and ask for your reactions from especially from the panel, especially from our discussions today. So she says, I'm hearing the legislative limitations. I'm wondering about ways of showing the human face of the impact of this behavior, referring to international cartels, how it affects consumers, and then activation of international consumer networks to raise public awareness in the home country of the transgressor as a form of pressure towards behavioral change. I would be interested to learn of possible instances where this may have happened. So do you know if this was used, consumers pressuring the governments for reform of competition laws to facilitate international cartel enforcement, let's say? consumer networks being active in the area of stronger enforcement in the area of competition law? I, I don't know myself. I mean, I haven't heard of any instances. If my, I, may, I may add, uh, um, I think that, that one of the challenges is that we are not seeing enough lobbying by consumers in any jurisdictions because consumers tend to be underrepresented in this uh, conversation. So this is an excellent idea. And of course, whatever advocacy we can get, that would be terrific, right? But uh, uh, this study, in this study, I have not come across any such examples. Thank you, Marek. Uh, in our work at UNTAD, we do voluntary peer review of competition law and policy, also, which now remi you reminded me of our work in that area. And then when we uh, do the report reviewing the law of the country and how to improve the competition law and the institution itself, we disseminate the findings in the in the country, in the peer-reviewed country, and then we engage also consumer associations and networks to come and hear about the, the situation, and they can voice their concerns at that moment, and it can be picked up by the legislators and competition agencies. That is, at least they have the forum there, they are included. So I can just think of that instance now. Um, Professor Waller, please. No, I, I think it's a great question, and I think it's, it, it highlights the importance of civil society besides just the, the legal experts, whether you're on the public side or the private side. And the more there can be uh, civic engagement, uh, more publicity in the newspapers. In Chile, Chile um, has business newspapers and general newspapers that run literally full page uh, stories on enforcement actions that highlight cartels in, in different sectors of the economy. And I was going to highlight one other thing. In, in, in England, there's a consumer uh, a group called Witch, uh, with a, a question mark as part of their title, which has been relentless in, in, in advocating and, and showing the way for consumers as to the harm that cartels have done. And they go so far as to also bring super complaints to the agencies and occasionally organize a private um, uh, uh, you know, private rights of action to try and recover for very high profile matters, such as a cartel that raised the si price significantly for a football jersey, for replica football jerseys worn by fans and tried to receive, uh, you know, recovery for, for the people who bought uh, overpriced, price fixed uh, items like that. So the more the merrier, and uh, we, we can never forget that uh, until you convince people that this matters, uh, enforcement will be hindered no matter how strong the, the laws and the, the enforcers are. Thank you very much, Professor Waller. La Laura Best said thank you to you in the chat. And uh, Imelda, also Professor Maher, you asked for the floor as well. Please go ahead. I'll be very brief. I, thank you, um, Arup. I know you're almost done. I, I, in a similar vein, um, Spencer, just to say that which are protected under the competition legislation in the UK um, to undertake those actions. But also the Australian model is worth looking at, and this goes back some time now, but I, as well as civil bodies, um, you can find a particularly uh, charismatic uh, competition agency leader. At, for example, Alan, I'm thinking of Alan Fells, 
who was known as sort of the white knight of the housewife, if you pardon the gendered language in Australia, um, known to be, you know, people would come up and ask him for his autograph because he was seen as protecting the consumer interest. So he managed, and I don't know quite how, but he definitely managed to transcend the perceived technical nature of competition law and to make it a consumer issue, which gave him tremendous political power. The joke was the most dangerous place in Australia between, um, was the distance between Alan Fells and a microphone. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Meyer, for that example, which was interesting. And uh, we need to close the, the event now. I'd like to thank all our speakers for your contributions and congratulations again, uh, Marek, for this report. I, I think it is uh, like the beginning of another <laughs> maybe lineup of work. <laughs> so I, um, yes, I would like to thank you, thank all of you. Thank you also to all participants for staying with us until now, for your patience and attention. Thank and thank you to Webru for looking after us today. <laughs> pleasure, pleasure. It was a great pleasure for me. Thank you all. Bye-bye. <clears throat> bye. Bye. Bye.